so your most recent uh record is uh share the wealth is it yeah share yeah. the wealth and the the trio has has expanded quite a bit so i just and then i i know uh about five years ago you, you made lovers which is also a large uh ensemble so I, i'm just mm -hmm. wondering uh coincidence or is there some something you're thinking about that makes you want to play in, in larger format groups this is a, actually a, a fun question to answer adam and i do have uh i guess my reasons <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, to backtrack, I started uh, my first trio with uh, originally with Michael Preissner on drums and uh, uh, Mark London Sims on bass, uh, but then later with the, the amazing Bob Mayer on electric bass. And uh, that was 1989 when I started it. And that was the first group I ever actually led. Prior to that, I'd been in uh, and somewhat concurrently with that trio of uh, democratic ensembles, I could say. Um, it sounds like an apocryphal uh, tall tale, but I have told this story before and I'll make it brief, which is that around the time of the mid eighties, I was in a crisis uh, aesthetically um, regarding the guitar and what to do with it and regarding the aesthetics of music and which way to go. I had too many conflicting impulses and I felt that I had to, for some reason, and perhaps it's the dichotomous Western mindset, I felt that I had to choose a direction in order to focus and create a, a certain kind of consistency or in, uh, even credibility. Um, so I was wanting to decide between acoustic guitar and electric guitar. I was playing acoustic guitar uh, a lot in the 80s with a group called Quartet Music, which was a 11 year long run uh, acoustic sort of chamber jazz group with Jeff Gautier, Eric Von Essen, and my brother, Alex Klein. And then uh, also I was playing nylon string guitar with Charlie Hayden's Liberation Music Orchestra West Coast, and then playing electric guitar in a rock band it started in the mid eighties called block. It was kind of a funk infused rock unit. Um, and I was playing with Julius Hemphill uh, for a while playing electric guitar. And I was really into Sonic Youth and really into Jim Hall and really into Paul Desmond and really into, uh, you know, uh, the Minutemen and whatever, and just trying to figure out what the hell to do with the guitar. So I almost quit is what happened. Oh, wow. And I thought I should either quit music because I was going so crazy and having su such a, a like a neurotic episode with this, or I should just switch instruments. So I thought I should play acoustic bass because I love acoustic bass and uh, pay a lot of attention to it. And I was thinking that, well, I could maybe do that. Um, well, of course, at the time, there was no way I was even going to be able to buy an acoustic bass. And, and if I didn't do music, what was I going to do? I thought, well, I could be a writer or a visual artist, you know, which are also not exactly money-making uh, ideas. And uh, we're solitary endeavors. And I really like the collaborative aspect of music making quite a bit. So I just decided, screw it. I'm going to just start my own band and just do any kind of music I want. Uh, meaning I will write all the music, meaning I will... Uh, you know, steer the ship, even if that means going in five directions at once or trying to. And it turned out to be a really satisfying uh, decision. And the reason I backtracked this far is because I decided it would be a trio. And the reason I wanted to do a trio was basically because of two reasons. One, it's fewer people to deal with, so easier to schedule uh, other people in the band. And uh, I felt I didn't have, number two, I didn't have the technique to front a trio. Hmm. Uh, it's a pretty terrifying thing. It's a powerful thing, the, the, the three, the number three in any kind of, whether it's guitar, bass, and drums or not, it's still, I think, a very powerful number and a very powerful kind of chemistry that can uh, make or break a band. Um, hmm. So when I started the Nels Klein Trio, uh, I had a motto which uh, predates Primus motto which was that we suck. Hmm. And uh, 
And that way I'd be relieved of the pressure, which of course I wasn't really, but I thought I'd be relieved of the pressure <laughs> of having to be as good as say, uh, you know, some of my favorite jazz electric guitar trios like John Schofield's with Steve Swallow and Adam Nussbaum, you know, that, which was a big inspiration. Yeah. And uh, John Abercrombie's trio with Peter Erskine and Mark Johnson, things like, like this were preying on my tiny brain. Right. Uh, so I thought if I said we suck, it would be at least some pressure release, you know, the valve would be half open or something. Uh, and so I persisted with that for a while and really didn't want to start another trio after that trio sort of fell apart after, geez, it's a number of years, I guess almost 10 years. And uh, it was Scott Amendola who kept bothering me to play after we, he and I had first met at my concert series I had going at the Alligator Lounge, oh, yeah. uh, where my trio anchored the series every Monday. And so I finally asked him when I had a car that might make it up there, I asked him uh, if I can get up there to the Bay Area uh, and so maybe I could start a new trio. And uh, the reason for a trio then was exactly the same. There was only two more people to think about and uh, it just felt like the language would be kind of expanded from the old trio because I was older and a little more experienced. And mm -hmm. also because Scott had his electronic array that he had uh, just sort of initiated that no one would let him use. And I said, you gotta bring that stuff and we'll figure out what to do with it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but flash forward many years, I got really, really weighed down by the trio format in terms of its emphasis on yours truly. Mm. Um, I also dogged by this term power trio, which uh, certainly applied to maybe a third of our material, but not all of it, you know? But anyway, I just couldn't take the idea of being the treble clef voice all the time. Uh, and I realized uh, when listening to my recordings back then that all attempts to have the bass as the melodic focus, uh, which was all with, at that point with Devin Hoff on bass, uh, satisfied me, but didn't necessarily uh, seem to work in live settings as well because of trying to get the sound right so that the, the bass as a melodic element would right. sing or speak and be apprehendable to the, to the audience, you know? Right. We're yeah. like, driving around on a shoestring with no front of house guy and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I added Ciro Baptista uh, around the time of this record called Macroscope, which I think now is about 10 years ago. Okay. Uh, and Ciro brought, even though uh, a non-melodic or uh, I guess you'd say like normal pitched instrumental aspect, it just having his energy and all the color that he brings to the music, which uh, reminded me of so many of my seminal influences from the early jazz rock fusion days, uh, really was the beginning of a relief uh, from the trio format. Hmm. And so uh, it made me feel that much different. It was interesting just to have four people and have all that color going on. I just felt a little bit more relaxed. I also started using wordless singing uh, on the records a little bit more. I had previously on our second record called The Giant Pin, I had Greg Sonye from Deerhoof do a little tiny uh, vocalese moment on one song. And that was the beginning of the singer is actually having singing, which blew the whole joke. <laughs> but the uh, so Macroscope was the first uh, record that sort of expanded out with permanent personnel. Like for example, the giant pin has John Bryan on keyboards on a couple of things. Huh. Uh, uh, Draw Breath has Glenn Kochi on additional percussion on a piece. Uh, so there were guests, you know, showing up here and there, but, but as far as playing live, it had been a trio forever and I just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, and so to move forward from that, the, uh, Share the Wealth Singers is just an expansion of the Macroscope Singers, which is the addition of saxophone and keyboards uh, and Ciro still being in the mix. And that was really just sort of a theoretical idea. 
uh, I definitely wanted to expand the group for a long time before I did it. And now uh, after jamming with Skerek, and I've known him now for maybe 18 years, but we had never played together. So we jammed on stage after a fish concert, they do these, these midnight jams. So there I was jamming with Skerek and Mono Neon and Billy Martin. Oh, wow. and, and Skerek and I finally played together and it was just so cool to mm. hear not only what he can do with his effects pedals, which dovetails into my world nicely, yeah. but, uh, but his ability to play really direct melodic material besides, he doesn't just blather all the time, right. uh, which maybe I do, but, but uh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I do, yeah. It was really cool. And then it was Scott Amendola who said, Skerek knows and loves all your music. And I just thought, okay, I love playing with Brian Marcella on keyboards. I'd play with him uh, when I guested in Ciro's band, Banquet of the Spirits. I think he's one of these unsung monster, amazing humans. And uh, and I just thought, okay, let's just record this this expanded thing and see what happens. So the idea of Share the Wealth was really kind of like the Nels Klein 4 record where I got people together and recorded stuff as demos that mostly ended up being masters or almost all um, in the case of share the wealth all of it ended up being the record huh. in the case of the nels klein four which i guess now that we're mentioning that was another attempt at a non-trio right but an outgrowth of the duo i've been doing with julian lodge so hmm. those tracks on that record were just done as demos and i uh got them to Don was who said, great. And so, whoa, we had a record. We had to do. So I added a couple of songs and that's that record. Wow. You know, there was, it was not, I didn't think I was making a blue note record on any of my blue note records. <laughs> like, Lovers was done and they licensed it and they licensed my stuff. So I finished them and then play them or mostly finish them and then play them for Don and then find out if the light is green or red and so far always been green. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, but uh, Lovers is a whole other story because Lovers has nothing to do with the story that I'm telling huh. about the discomfort uh, as being the treble clef instrument in a trio. It just has to do with a fantasy of a project that I was carrying around in my head for over 20 years. Hmm. And so uh, with the help of David Breskin producing and Michael Leonard uh, arranging and conducting, I was able to do this fantasy project uh, mostly because I had described it to David Breskin who insisted that it happened and made sure that it happened. So, so that's just your a description whole to him. What, what was, how did you describe to David what, what you wanted to do? Well, it's funny because I would actually been courted by a couple of major labels, uh, but they're jazz wing, meaning they're like tax write-off wing or whatever. <laughs> right. uh, one was Sony Jazz and the other one was Warner Brothers Jazz. Mm -hmm. And this idea had been in my head for so long that I remember being taken to lunch in two instances from each label with very sincere uh, gentlemen who wanted to sign me to the label and in both cases, the label heads told him no way. They looked at my sound scans or something and said, this guy doesn't sell any records. Mm. Forget it. <laughs> yeah. But but I had described the project to them as well. Okay. Uh, the project did change over time, but it was a much darker project uh, in, in its first iteration in my brain. And the idea was to do uh, my version of a mood music, romantic mood music record, uh, that revealed the the sort of darker aspects of of a romantic liaison or the the some of the scarier aspects of love hmm. and not idealized but super moody but not negative and scary but maybe sort of scary so uh that's what i described it as and as a large ensemble work like a big band but with strings and harp on some things and uh and so I just kept it on my to-do list for a long time. And so, because these people would always ask, I'm sure you've probably been asked this, like, so man, we really like to do a project with you. Like make a list of like anybody you'd you like to work with that you've never worked with or a project you've always wanted to get off the ground that you've never been able to get off the ground. And so yeah. there it was right at the top of the list for 20 plus years. And David Breskin asked me the same thing. 
uh, when he was thinking that he might revive the Shifting Foundation, which has uh, since lovers uh, gone into full swing and funded music, art, and literature uh, of artists that they deem worthy of such all over the world. And uh, so that's what happened. He asked that question, I answered it, and then he be David became obsessed with the idea of the project and kept following up on me. Like, uh, what are you doing with Lovers? How's Lovers going? And this is when I was gonna arrange the whole thing myself. So as a result of my fear and insecurity, I never started arranging anything. I just kept changing the song list for, you know, 20 years, the song list would expand, contract, take this song off, add this one, you know, so that was a fantasy project. And, and in fact, uh, really was kind of scary also because it was going to showcase what initially I thought was going to be complete jazz guitar sound with no effects whatsoever and no looping. Uh, when we finally did it and the thing had become what it is now on the set list, uh, I realized I did have to do some of my sort of noises hmm. to make it something other than a very conservative sounding project and also which would concomitantly uh, bring up my limitations as a fake jazz person. Like if you just went for like a, I don't know, like a Johnny Smith guitar tone or something. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Which, which is just too funny. If you think about my sort of musical limitations in that area and also my proclivities in certain sonic areas, you know? Yeah. Well, that's my long winded as usual answer to your question. 